With me today is Dr. Sanjay Singh. He is Chairman of Neurology and a professor at Creighton University. An epilepsy is an electrical storm in your brain. Um, and about 3.5 million people in the United States have epilepsy. About 20 to 25,000 people in Nebraska have epilepsy. Um, what has happened in the world of epilepsy is that it is the one neurological condition where there are more treatments than any of the other types. Mm. So there are lots of drugs, lots of new drugs that are there. Um, if drugs fail, then there's surgery. So if you can identify where a seizure is coming from and you can cut that, safely cut that region out, then that's epilepsy surgery. Or the third FDA approved treatment is a vagal nerve stimulator. It's like a pacemaker of your brain. So you put a pacemaking device here and you put two leads in the neck and then it buzzes for about 30 seconds every five minutes or so. And that's an approved form of treatment for epilepsy and seizures too. Let me ask you something. Um, a, a woman that I know has Parkinson's disease and she just had a mechanism put in. Is it a similar type of something that does something to reboot sure. the brain? It is similar. In Parkinson's what's happening is that your one chemical in your brain called dopamine that is not in quantities that it needs to be, so it's mm -hmm. less than mm -hmm. before. And that causes the body and, uh, to be rigid, have tremors, uh, those sorts of things mm -hmm. happen in Parkinson's. And so you, the first treatment is always medical. You give them drugs that bump up this chemical dopamine, mm -hmm. and so they start moving better. Mm -hmm. But there comes a time when, this, when the cells forming dopamine, this chemical in your brain, the cells have died off, so there is none to really augment now. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in some of those advanced cases, uh, what you do is you put in a deep brain stimulator. So you put in uh, a stimulator wires in the depths of your brain, and then they are connected to this pacemaker uh -huh. in, in, in your chest. And that, because of its stimulation of the brain, can actually do away with tremor. So you could have someone having a tremor and you switch on the stimulator and the tremor goes away. Mm -hmm. So that's another new form of treatment for Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease. And so I'm, I'm guessing that that's what mm -hmm. she does have. And just, we'll go back to epilepsy here in a minute, but Parkinson's, is that also something then, then you, you have yes. patients with Parkinson's? Yes. And that's a neurological. That's a neurological thing and that is something that we treat too. So neurologists treat Parkinson's, treat stroke, we treat, treat epilepsy, we treat dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. Um, um, and, you know, all the conditions like multiple sclerosis that is there, uh, all the nerve disorders, the neuropathy, spinal cord problems, all of these are treated by neurologists. By this neurologist. is all, any problems with the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, and the muscles are under the purview of a neurologist. See, I think you think of neurology as just the brain. You don't think of all the parts of that course. go with it. All right, I regress. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to epilepsy, but it just spurred me to go, I wonder if that's what it is. Um, okay, so this mechanism you put in for epilepsy, and what does that do? It it's called a vagal nerve stimulator, and what it does is that it stimulates your vagus nerve, and that stimulation is carried back into your brain, and that prevents seizures from happening. Um, seizures are essentially, you know, your brain cells talk to one another by electrical discharges, so there's electricity happening there. When you have an abnormal electrical discharge or a mini electrical storm, that's seizure. Uh, anything that can break that electrical storm, that's treatment. So when, when you give drugs, they calm those currents down. They don't let those abnormal currents or the storm get strong enough to cause a seizure. So the, that's what the drugs essentially do. Now, if the drugs are not being able to calm it down, uh, then if you identify a region where that storm is arising from uh, because of abnormality, and if, that's, if it is safe to cut that region out, then we can cut that part out. Uh, and that's epilepsy surgery, mm -hmm. and p patients go through that too. Uh, the third is this vagal nerve stimulator that mm -hmm. I talked about. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of new treatments that are just on the anvil right now. Mm -hmm. There is the deep brain stimulator that I talked about for Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. it, is in, it has finished its last trials for epilepsy, and it is showing benefits. So mm -hmm. the FDA is looking <coughs> at it, and uh, we are waiting to get the FDA mandate before we start using it. There's also uh, a fascinating new way of treating epilepsy where you find out where the seizure is coming from. You put an electrical lead there and you connect it to a computer. And the computer is monitoring the waves coming from there. And as soon as it detects that a seizure is, has started, it stimulates that region, shocks it, and stops the seizure. And it's all happening without you ever knowing about it. Hmm. So lots of new treatments that are on the anvil. Another exciting uh, tool that is being studied is a transcranial magnetic stimulator. So it's like a wand 
which magnetically either stimulates or s inhibits. So it either excites or stops the functioning of areas of the brain. So if you do it at certain frequencies right from outside, there's no drug involved, no surgery, just non-invasive magnetic uh, impulses, they have the potential of treating epilepsy too. So the, the plan there is that they would come in once every three to six weeks, get the stimulation done with this transcranial magnetic stimulator, this wand on the outside, and that would help them uh, decrease their number of seizures. So lots of new treatments that are on the anvil. You mentioned in Nebraska there are 25,000 cases of epilepsy. As I was preparing for the show, I was trying to think of the people I knew that had epilepsy, and I only came up with two. Is it a disease that is people are just keeping quiet about, or is it a case that they're being effectively medicated so that it's not apparent? A little bit of both. I think in years gone by, I would say 30, 40 years ago, people did not openly talk about uh, their family members who had epilepsy. Um, and so, yes, there's some of that. Fortunately, with a lot of education and awareness, that, that has gone away. Um, or at least has gone away to a large degree mm -hmm. here in the United States. Uh, the other is, yes, there are really good treatments for epilepsy. So you have a significant number of people who are now seizure-free. And so they, you know, people who are seizure-free go on to live very normal lives. And about 60 to 70 percent of people become seizure-free. Uh, and so those people... Meaning those it only happened at one point in their yes. life and it's all over now. It's all <laughs> over now and for a, a period of several years they have not never had a seizure. My. And so they go on to live very normal lives. Uh, and even those who are having infrequent seizures, uh, if they're well controlled, they can still uh, go on to live very normal lives. In fact, some of the most successful people in history have had epilepsy. You such would, as? Such as Julius Caesar, Alexander, Van Gogh, Da Vinci, you know, a lot of these most successful people in history have had seizures, and some of very some very successful people in the current times have have epilepsy and seizures. Um, and so, once these seizures are controlled, people go on to live very very normal lives. Is is there some epilepsy that is not able to be cured? Are there some extreme cases? There are about 10 to 20 percent of cases of epilepsy which are uh, not responding to current treatments, and that is why we are looking for brand new treatments, mm -hmm. as I talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and that because 10 to 20 percent would be between 300 to 600,000 people in the country. Mm -hmm. And so clearly that is where a lot of research is being done to find new cures. It's also important to get your s epilepsy and seizures under control because there is this entity um, called SUDEP, which is Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. And so it happens more often in people whose seizures are not under good control. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is important to get your seizures under good control uh, and go to a doctor that specializes in it and try out all the possible treatments that are there. Because unfortunately, uh, research has shown that it takes people 10 years to try two drugs to establish that. And it should never take that long mm -hmm. because we have 14 to 16 drugs now that are available and there are so many other treatment options that no one should have to just wait on two drugs and keep having seizures. There's a little child down the street from me who had a seizure last week and um, I was visiting with his grandmother and the grandmother said, oh, it was nothing. He'd had a shot that day and it was nothing. Seizures are something. Seizures are something. That means that there was an electrical storm in the brain. Now, if someone's had one seizure without any tests, what is their chances of having a second one? Uh, and that number would be about 30 to 35 percent. Okay. So yes, uh, majority of people will not have a second one, fortunately. Uh, but that seizure does need to be evaluated. Yes. Every seizure patient should have brain imaging, preferably an MRI, and an EEG, which is a brain wave test that tells you if there is a <coughs> tendency to have seizures. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if these tests are abnormal, the chances of having a second one go up significantly mm -hmm. higher. And so if you have abnormal findings in this, your physician might then decide to actually treat mm -hmm. this single seizure. Uh, so it is very important to get them properly evaluated with their physicians um, and should not be ignored. Let's spend our last couple of minutes talking about the uh, neurocenter that's being built at uh, the hospital, uh, Creighton University Medical Center. Um, I know that changes in lifestyle are often apparent with a neurological disease. I was intrigued that 
I believe you, you share some space with the orthopedic area. Yes. And um, tell me about that. Why would you share space with orthopedics? So yeah, let me tell you f a little bit about the neurocenter. Uh, at Creighton, we are developing a brand new uh, floor of caring which will be dedicated towards neurological disorders. We are also building a brand new neurology clinic. Uh, which is going to just deal with patients with neurological disorders. And we're also renovating the department where a lot of our faculty and staff and research is going to happen. So we are really building things brand new, and everything should be done in, uh, by May or June of this year. So it is a very exciting time. Uh, and it tells, tells us that Creighton has put a lot of stock in treating patients with neurological disorders. Uh, and this is something that is really significant in the field of neurology and neuroscience as a whole. The, why, what is the reason that we are sharing some of the space and resources with orthopedics? Because patients with orthopedic disorders uh, and neurological disorders have some similar needs. Uh, they may be immobile. They, if you've had a stroke and you're paralyzed, you're not able to walk and move as you should. If you've had a fracture of your, of your leg, you're not able to move. So uh, both of these uh, patients would need a lot of help from physical therapist, occupational therapist. And so as we are building the new neuro neurology, neuroscience floor, what we are doing is that we have the rehab center right there on the floor so that the patients are not being wheeled to great distances to get these therapies. It's right there, right next to them. The, the whole neurological setup, in the whole neurological center with the outpatient, the inpatient, and the departments all contiguous with uh, one another. So it's a, it's a remarkable new thing that's happening at Creighton. Um, and it really speaks volumes of Creighton's um, investment and Creighton's dedication towards treatment of neurological disorders. It occurred to me that, in, that it's sometimes a disease, sometimes referred to as a disorder, and sometimes referred to as a condition. What is the difference between a neurological disease, a neurological condition, and a neurological, neurological disorder? So epilepsy is, should be correctly referred to as a disorder. Um, Parkinson's should be correctly referred to as a disease. And the reason for that is that Parkinson's, there is a specific problem <clears throat> in the brain where the dopamine cells are dying off, and that is the single process that causes Parkinson's, and that is why it is called a disease. Single problem causing a single effect uh, like Parkinson's. Whereas epilepsy is a disorder. Why? Because several diseases cause epilepsy. If you have a brain tumor, that will cause epilepsy. Head trauma damage, that will cause epilepsy. If you have malformation of the brain, that will cause. So several diseases are leading to epilepsy, and that's why it's called a disorder. So cor the correct terminology would be epilepsy is a disorder. Parkinson's is a disease. Um, some people ask about what's the difference between seizure and epilepsy. I have a seizure, but mm -hmm. I don't have epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has mm. two or more unprovoked seizures, by unprovoked I mean not under the influence of drugs or alcohol, so more than two unprovoked seizures qualifies for the definition of epilepsy. So epilepsy is a chronic seizure disorder. So if you've had just one seizure, you have seizures. If you've had more than two, two or more seizures, you have epilepsy. Thank you.